Well, thank you for having me. Um, Dr. Tandy knows that NCDs are very close to my heart and I'm always ready to talk about them, whether it's hypertension or diabetes or cancer. And Sister Tandy and I have known each other since I was a wee little uh, medical graduate in 2014. So I've been under their wing for almost a decade now. Time flies. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk about cervical cancer and in particular, in particular the HPV vaccine. I think you're all aware that we're rolling it out in Eswatini and a lot of people, in particular in my family, were a bit skeptical about sending their daughters or themselves to the HPV vaccine. So I just want to clarify why we're doing it, how it's going to help our kids and uh, um, just how it works so that you have a better understanding of what we are doing. Um, I'll give a brief on how big the burden of cervical cancer is in Eswatini. But before I get into that, I like to interact with my people. So what do we know about cervical cancer? Is there anyone who wants to tell me what they really know about cervical cancer? Not you, Sister Faith. You <laughs> <laughs> Someone from the audience. Even the young kids. Yes? Yes, that's one of the risk factors. Any other takers? A mammogram or? Yes, we will touch on pap smear and how it's no longer the gold standard. And yes, I'm going to touch a few people from the Ministry of Health about this, but pap smear is no longer the gold standard. <laughs> but we'll get into that. So cervical cancer is the most common HPV-associated cancer among women, with about half a million cases uh, around 2008, and about half of those died in 2008. So about a quarter of the cervical cancers occur in women who are between the ages of 35 and 44. I think the majority of us are around there. So the majority of us need to do a lot of screening. And then we also do have some cases where 14% of the cases are between the ages of 20 and 34, which is really early onset cervical cancer, but we'll touch on the risk factors that could lead you to have early onset cervical cancer. And then we have the 23.9 who are above 45. Those are usually mostly um, late, not late, uh, uh, diagnosis but late presentation. We'll touch on the difference between a late diagnosis and a late presentation and how it affects the situation with cancers as a whole. So the cervical cancer in Eswatini is the most common cancer in Eswatini. Eswatini has the highest incident rate of cervical cancer in the world. It's unfortunate, and a lot of people don't know this, but we have the highest incident of cervical cancer in the whole world. So it's a bit of a sobering thought to know that uh, we have the highest rate. Uh, to add to that, two-thirds of all our cases of cervical cancer end in premature death. 66% of all the women that we diagnose with cervical cancer die within five years of the diagnosis. That is how serious the case is in Eswatini. I watch a lot of news like Tandi. I read a lot of books. I watch a lot of news. I actually don't know any other channels besides the news channels. <laughs> but I don't know if you people follow that there's actually a meeting in Botswana, I think it ended yesterday, to discuss the elimination of cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. We had uh, stakeholders from Eswatini attend there and we are the biggest uh, contributor to cervical cancer uh, patients in sub-Saharan Africa, and we have the worst um, treatment outcomes as of 2023. So the incident, as you can see, we have a 35.4% incident of cervical cancer within the country, of which it leads to 36.1% of all the deaths 
that are attributed to uh, cancers within the country. We'll touch on cervical cancer, but we'll also touch on other HPV-associated cancers because a lot of people think it's just cervical cancer, but HPV is doing a lot more harm in the public than we are aware of. So uh, she touched on the risk factors for cervical cancer. So the factors that increase the risk are, for one, not attending for screening. And in this country, I can understand why you would not attend for screening, because it's not mandatory. When I moved to the UK in 2021, two months after arriving, I got a call from my GP to say I need to come for my annual cancer screen for cervical cancer. Two months. They just got my address. They knew that this is my GP. They called me. They're like, you are due for your annual cervical cancer screen. How many of you can say they've had a cervical cancer screen in the last three years? In this forum. So we have a lot of work to do as just the public health sector, the ministry, about how we can you know, increase our intake of screening. And then another <coughs> risk factor is persistent infection with uh, HPV. I'm going to touch on the difference between persistent infection with HPV and a transient infection. Having many sexual partners or a sexual partner with many sexual partners. So it might not be you with the, sexu with the many sexual partners, but your partner who you are uh, trusting has other partners. So that increases your risk of cervical cancer because it increases your risk of getting HPV. Smoking, uh, in this case, smoking nicotine, um, smoking uh, snuff for Wokoko, because they don't like to use the cigarettes, they like to, to use the snuff. So that also increases their risk. Any immunosuppressive disorder, uh, in our setting it's usually HIV, but it could be any other immunosuppressive disease like cancer or being on chemotherapy or radiotherapy and such like. And having children at a young age. This is because if you have a child at a very young age, it means your sexual debut was also at a very young age. That increases, one, the number of chances you're going to have more than one sexual partner. Two, for women, because this is a forum for women, we are aware that most of the time uh, in our society, a young girl's first sexual partner is usually a lot older than her. So chances are he's been already with other people before he was with her. So those are the issues that cause a, a higher risk factor, especially in, in our setting in Eswatini. And then not being vaccinated against HPV, which is why we are here. We're here to, to speak about why we should take our daughters for HPV vaccine. So the HPV vaccine, there are about 200 types of HPV, uh, HPV virus, I mean. And of those 200, about 40 affect the genital area. So some of them will cause genital warts, some of them will cause cervical cancer, some of them will cause anorectal uh, cancer, some of them will cause penile cancer. And I know this is in a church setting, uh, but depending on what type of uh, sexual activities people do, HPV can also cause oral pharyngeal cancers because of whatever activities people decide to do with their sexual partners. So we need to take that in mind as well. So. Though HPV exists and it causes our usual warts in Zumbe that we all have, especially La Swatini, that's another risk factor that they've discovered here, that we do have the genetic predisposition to getting HPV by virtue of just being La Swatini and La Swatini, because a lot of us already have HPV, which we can also get from our mothers during natural childbirth. So, <laughs> HPV associated cancers and conditions, like I touched on the most important one, the one that we're discussing today is cervical cancer. But we can also have penile cancer for our young boys, our husbands, our brothers, anal cancer depending on uh, your sexual orientation and your sexual activities, vaginal cancer, respiratory papillomatosis if you are engaging in oral sex and then it goes down into the throat and oropharyngeal cancer, which is your nose, your sinuses, your mouth. 
So HPV, chances are all of us have at some point in time, if you're sexually active or have engaged in any sexual activity, whether or not it is penetrative, you might have been infected with HPV at some point in your life. There are two things that can happen with an HPV infection. So you can either have a regression where you've had the HPV infection and you won't know that you've had the HPV infection. So before I continue, if we go out today and you start HPV testing, please don't think that it is your current partner. It could have been 20 <laughs> years ago when you got the infection. So please do not think that there's anything going on between you and your current partners. This is something that could, <laughs> that could have happened 20, 30 years ago. But there is a natural progression depending on how many risk factors you have and your, your, your general uh, likelihood of getting cancer. So you can have the HPV infection and it can disappear. Or you can have the HPV infection and it can persist. The problem is when it persists. When you have persistent HPV infection, in particular with uh, a certain subtype 16 and 18, which we found here in Eswatini to be about 80% of the HPV virus that we find in the country is the 1618, which is the one that causes cervical cancer. So when you have a good immune system, you'll get the HPV infection and it will disappear. If something happens and it's persistent, then it continues. And to touch on the spread of HPV, like I said, it does not have to be a, a penetrative sexual intercourse. Any type of sexual activity, whether it's uh, uh, kissing or fondling each other, depending on what the plan is, which is why we want to vaccinate our children at an early age, and I'll touch on that, can cause the HPV uh, virus to be spread, so long as there is skin-to-skin -skin contact. It does not need to be sexual intercourse. And there is the chance of getting HPV from your mother through natural childbirth. So when you have exposures that increase your risk of getting cervical cancer, so your multiple sexual partners, your early sexual debut, uh, a, 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 a large number of children, the reason why a large number of children causes you to have a higher risk factor is you're probably not using protection. That's why you're pregnant, and that also increases your chances of getting HPV over and over again. So again, if your partner is not circumcised, because uh, our males tend to be a reservoir of HPV virus, so if your partner is not circumcised, that's also a risk factor to getting HPV virus. This will be your normal cervix. After a year, you will have an HPV-infected cervix. Uh, if you have a weak immune system, you have other STDs, you've got the genetics that we have, Laswatini, and you get high-risk HPV infection, 16 or 18, then this can cause persistent infection. This persistent infection is also affected by your microenvironment. Your microenvironment is uh, smoking and the long-term of oral contraceptives. Yes, it's unfortunate. A lot, a lot of things can work against us as women because we're trying not to have the many kids, but then we're also exposing our our bodies to a risk for cervical cancer. So it can persist and as you can see, there are many places where it can regress. So you can just have the infection or you can start having the changes that uh, Marge Faith spoke about, where you start seeing the cell changes in your cervix, but there's still chances of that infection actually regressing after four to five years. High grade is where the problem starts chances of a regression of that infection are very, very low, and chances of it progressing into cervical cancer become higher. Um, I will digress because people spoke about supplements and um, antioxidants. Uh, I read a lot. There's, <laughs> there's a study that actually was released last week about the use of antioxidants and vitamin C uh, for patients with uh, low-grade uh, squamous changes. You take them and the assumption is when you take these uh, supplements, you're gonna get better. Unfortunately, the cancer cell does not work like that. 
So what they've discovered is that if you take more antioxidants or you take vitamin C, when you have uh, high-grade squamous lesions, not the cancer, just the cell changes, you're actually accelerating the chances of you getting to cervical cancer because a cancer cell does not work the same way as a normal cell. This is a cell that is hyperactive. So when you give it something that can, because you are thinking I'm gonna give the vitamin C and the antioxidants to help my other cells get better, but the tumor works faster than your other cells, so you are feeding it. So now they're trying to discuss whether or not to remove vitamin C's and antioxidants off the counters in America for uh, patients who thought they were helping themselves by trying to boost the immune system, but uh, you actually boosted the cancer. So a lot is changing about how we deal with our patients who have uh, uh, precancerous lesions. So signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. So this will depend on um, the stage. I don't want to get too technical, but basically before it gets to stage one, the only way we will find out if you have cervical cancer is if you go for a screening. Because you will be asymptomatic, nothing will be wrong with you, you'll be going on with your life. So most of the time it's a chance finding when we do screening, which is why most countries uh, advocate for screening for people who are above the age of 25 yearly if they are HIV positive and then every three years if you are HIV negative. Unfortunately we have this on paper <laughs> as a country we just don't have the resources to do that because no one put up their hand about uh, doing a screening in the last three years so we are lacking in terms of trying to diagnose at an early stage and this is why we have the highest rate of cervical cancer because we are not screening in time. And this is also why we have the highest rate of death in sub-Saharan Africa because by the time our patients come, they come with these early symptoms. Stage 1B where you have the abnormal bleeding, whether it's po post-coital, this is after sexual intercourse, or intermenstrual between your periods, or post-menopausal if you had already uh, gone through menopause and you start having bleeding or an ab abnormal discharge, whether it's blood-stained, dirty, and foul-smelling. And one of the reasons why this takes a long time is there's always a stigma, especially with women, about going to discuss how you have a, a discharge, an offensive discharge. You feel like you can't, especially if it's a male doctor. I know some people who actually wait at RFM until I finished and then come and say, I have been waiting to see you because I couldn't see your colleague because he's male because there's a stigma about you know, the, the female reproductive system in general. It's not something that's talked about. It's not something that is uh, you know, cherished, if I might say that, because we don't talk about it. When you, when you have problems, you can't really talk about them until they get really bad. And by that time, it's late. And then we have the late symptoms, which is usually our postmenopausal women pelvic pain, urinary symptoms, rectal symptoms, and in particular, a back pain. And a lot of times when we see our patients, we don't you know, dig deeper and find out how many kids did Goko have? Uh, does she also have a PV discharge? Is there a lump? We just assume that Goko has arthritis, and we leave it at that. But one of the main late symptoms of cervical cancer in postmenopausal women, especially if it's late stage and has uh, spread, is back pain, persistent back pain. So the role of the HPV vaccine in cervical uh, cancer prevention, I think I've touched on what causes cervical cancer. It's the human papilloma virus. And the reason why we want to uh, start uh, vaccinating our young children is because for our generation, I'm sorry to say it's late for us. Uh, if you go in some countries, you are still, uh, they still do give HPV vaccines to the already sexually active uh, uh, ladies, but it is not for free, uh, which is, I think would be the same thing we'd do here in Eswatini. So the reason why uh, starting HPV vaccination for our girls at their young age is so that they don't get to a point where they are infected and 20 years later they have cervical cancer. 
uh, Australia is three years, no, five years away from being cervical cancer free because they have an HPV vaccination schedule for both girls and boys. I'll touch on why we started with just the girls. But they have seen a 91% decrease in not just cervical cancer, but your, your anorectal cancers, your genital warts, purely because they started uh, vaccinating their school-going children from the age of 9 to 15 in 2007. So they haven't even been doing it for that long, but they're five years away from being cervical cancer free. So currently, according to the Ministry of Health, we are giving two different vaccines, depending on the availability. They are interchangeable, so please do not worry. So they all are from uh, Gardasil. We do not have GlaxoSmithKline, but we have Gardasil, uh, 6, 11, 16, 8, which we call Gardasil 4. And then we also have Gardasil 9. This is what we're giving the young girls in the schools currently as the vaccination. So indications are for females and uh, males. I'll touch on why we haven't started giving our boys. But a contraindication is pregnancy, which is why we want to start before they are sexually active. Because I touched on how HPV is spread even without penetrative sexual intercourse. So we want to catch them in primary school before they, they start uh, having the, 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 the crushes and you know th those teenage play games that we all went through. So let's not all pretend we did not go through them. What we're trying to do is ensure that by the time they get there, they are already protected, which is why we're going for the younger school girls. So it's made from proteins, it's inactivated. I know a lot of people after COVID, there was misinformation and disinformation. Everybody's afraid of vaccines. <laughs> but our clinical trials have shown how effective it is. I think we look at uh, even the UK, they are also uh, winning in terms of cervical cancer, but not as much as Australia. Australia is like the, the country everyone is looking towards to try and emulate and try and vaccinate their kids in that way. So the safety of the vaccine, it's pretty safe. And I, I'll use myself as, a, as, a, as an example. I was lucky enough, I'm in the UK, though I have already passed the age of the vaccine, you are allowed to get it so long as you can afford it. So I went to my gynae, my gynae said, fine, you can get the, the vaccine. And it, it, it was safe, it treated me well. And I'm happy to say I came to see my gynae when I came back and I'm fine. Everything is okay. Um, I, like I said, at some point in time, everyone would have had HPV at some point in time. They did find HPV with me, it was 16, 18, the worst kind. And I, ha I have gotten the three, uh, uh, doses and just last week I was by EPH and everything is fine. So if you are in a position to, to do that for yourself as a, an, an older female who's already sexually active, I would advise it. But right now I need to talk about what we can afford as a nation which is trying to vaccinate our children. But if you can, as a woman who's older than the, the cutoff point that they want in the ministry, I, I advise you to see your gynae and get some advice from there. So the, it's safe. Um, so the plan is to give individual doses of two doses uh, of 0 0.5 between 0 0.6 to 12 months uh, to people under the age of 15. How old are you guys? Oh, per, 14. Perfect. You see, these are the people that we're trying to reach. So they will get two doses. The first dose could be today and then six months after. If uh, our children are immunosuppressed, because we do have our children who are living with HIV, those ones we plan on giving three doses. So it will be zero, six, and 12. So they will get three doses in one year. And then hopefully, once we've got the uptake, the plan is to go above the children who are above the age of 15 and try and, and, try and give them three doses, regardless of their immunosuppression. The reason why after the age of 15, we are giving three doses is because we know puberty and what has happened between the age of nine and 15, you might have already been exposed to some HPV viruses. So, 
possible side effects is just a regular mouth jovi where there's pain, and after that, that's fine. Uh, a lot of questions that I get from um, my sisters, uh, my, my friends who, with daughters, when they started uh, rolling it out is, but she's so young. Why should I take my nine-year-old daughter to a vaccine that has something to do with cervical cancer and is more uh, inclined to when she has her sexual debut? And my answer is always, even with our kids in the immunization schedule, we don't wait for the measles to happen. We don't wait for, for, for diphtheria to happen. We try and protect them before the exposure. So it's the same thing is with our, our, our kids. We're trying to get to them before they have any exposure that could lead them to get HPV uh, infection. And then there's the question of the boys. That's another question I always get. We are a resource limited country. Ordinarily, we should be vaccinating all our children in Australia, because when they started in Australia in 2007, they were only vaccinating their, their girls. And that actually caused herd immunity. So both boys and girls were protected. So we are using that as a way to see whether or not we can get herd immunity. And obviously when the resources allow, we would ideally want to be able to also vaccinate our, our boys. Because like I, I said, especially if uh, your, your son is not circumcised, he becomes a reservoir of the HPV uh, virus. And he might then spread it to his wife or his girlfriend or his future partner. And then we're back at square one with uh, not having eradicated uh, cervical cancer. So, yeah, uh, I think those are my key messages. It's not a new vaccine, it's new to the country. Uh, and I know a lot of people are like, where did we get it? Because we tend to get a lot of things for free. <laughs> we actually did not get it for free. We have been trying to get this HPV vaccine from Gavi since 2018, I think. And then COVID happened, and then there was a long list of other countries that, had, that could you know, afford the subsidized prices. But it's finally here. It wasn't a freebie. Uh, there's clinical trials that show that it works. Um, we have a high disease burden. Um, like I said, for our generation, it, it might be a bit too late for the HPV vaccine. So what we can do for our generation is uh, screening. And uh, I want to touch on the pap smear. It's no longer what is used. We still use it here in the country because we're still trying to, to get resources to do HPV testing. But we, the world has moved to HPV testing now, not just a pap smear. So it's exactly like a pap smear. Nothing's changed, but we're not looking for the cells. We are looking for HPV infection. The reason why we're looking for HPV infection is because we want to also subtype which HPV infection you have and then decide according to your risk factors how often you then need to come back to us for another screen. But uh, pap smears are still available, but the problem with pap smears is like uh, uh, Maggie Faith touched on, it will only show you when the damage has already been done. What we're trying to do is find uh, the HPV virus before the damage starts. So if we find that you have HPV vaccine, then we have a high alert that we need to monitor you more closely, whether it's six monthly or annually instead of the three years, because pap smear has shown that by the time we use pap smear, most people have the changes. And the changes can occur between your, your, your annual screen and your next screen. So you might have had a, a normal pap smear last year, and then you come to me, especially Laswatini, and you, with our 16 and 18, it's very aggressive. And then you come and you already have the changes. But if we had done the HPV testing last year, we would have already known that you have 16 and 18, and would have brought you earlier for another screen, probably six months instead of the one year or three years. So that is where we are with that. But, my key message is we're just trying to secure a cancer-free future for our children. It's not about us, <laughs> unfortunately. The boat has sailed for us, but for our kids, and I don't mean the girls only because 
uh, once they are vaccinated, they are also protecting their, their partners from uh, penile cancer, from oropharyngeal cancer, from all the cancers that are HPV associated because the vaccine covers a great number of those subtypes, but in particular 16 and 18. And just to end, I don't know how many of you know the story about the lady who bled for 12 years in the Bible. We do not know what made her bleed. So we do not know if it was cervical cancer and how long cervical cancer has been around, but she bled for 12 years. And the one thing that she did was just have faith. She did not ask questions. She did not scream and say, Jesus, see me. She just touched his cloak. And because of her faith, he felt the power of healing leave him. And that's why he asked, who touched me? So if you have a family member who has cervical cancer or any type of cancer, I think the Bible just teaches us to have faith. Like Margaret Faith touched on, sometimes science will say it's not going to happen, and then God makes it happen. I am a testimony of that. A lot of people don't know. Um, when I went to UK, I got a very, very bad fungal infection and almost lost my eye. Uh, the Friday before I was supposed to sign, uh, allowing them to remove my eye, uh, I called my family and we prayed. We prayed and we prayed. And then on Monday when they came to check me, she was shocked herself. She actually, she's an ophthalmologist from Egypt. She actually presented my case in Durban, I think early this year, because they tried everything. They cultured, they could not find what was wrong with me. They took my specimens all across the UK. They could not find what was wrong with my eye, but something was eating up my eye. And I was now getting septic and she said to me, you know what, we need to remove the focus of the infection and you need to decide. So I said, give me the weekend. And we prayed. And they did not remove the eye. So it's about faith. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions?